Associate Professor James Lim. Mr. Speaker, the amendments proposed to the Free Trade Zone Act are meant to provide better oversight for the flow of goods through our nation's FTZs, essentially by devolving a number of functions away uh, from authorities appointed by the minister to licensed FTZ operators and cargo handlers. It may be seen as a devolution of operational responsibilities to a more decentralized regime, which could have the benefit of also simultaneously being more efficient. These changes are also, according to the Ministry's public consultation documents, meant to enable better, and I quote, detection, deterrence, and prevention of money laundering, unquote, and associated terrorist financing. To this end, these objectives to improve efficiency as well as safety are sound and should be supported. My comments will briefly touch on some aspects of the bill before moving on to discuss broader considerations about how FTZs operate in Singapore. I will then try to close with reflections on the evolving nature of FTZs in our global economy. Section 10 confers powers to the Director General or DG to prohibit a person from entering or residing in an FTZ. This vests significant discretionary power to the DG and there's some ambiguity and uncertainty in terms of its scope and application. What conditions does the ministry expect such prohibitions to be exercised? One could imagine cases where a fugitive or would-be fugitive seeks refuge in the zone, in which case certainly national laws or, and regulations would naturally apply. Would the ministry consider requiring the DG to publish the underlying rationale for any prohibitions imposed when exercised. By doing so, the Director General can provide greater transparency on when it uses its discretionary powers. The new Section 14N compels FTZ operators and cargo handlers to submit reports on suspicious goods. This is reasonable, but the process of submitting such reports appears to place the onus on the agents. There does not appear to be any routine reporting, for instance, unless specifically asked to do so by the DG. This provides incentives for operators and handlers that hope to avoid taking on additional regulatory burdens to remain somewhat conservative in their assessment of when goods may justify reporting. As far as I can gather, the bill does not provide guidance on, say, red flags or other thresholds associated with potentially suspicious goods. So may, it may be therefore useful to include in a schedule in the Annex, for instance, predetermined frameworks on what the Ministry believes to be appropriate thresholds or red flags. A sufficiently clear and comprehensive set of guidelines will allow operators to continue applying flexibility in determining what falls within or without the threshold, but ensure that all appropriate cases are flagged for prop possible investigation. Such an action also removes the possibility of excess discretion that the Ministry might not wish to confer. Section 14 P part 6 stipulates that a decision by the DG to suspend or revoke an operational license or to impose a regulatory action takes effect from the date on which the notice is served or any other date as specified in the notice. While well, I appreciate that such snap suspensions can serve a purpose when seeking to arrest illegal or illicit activity without triggering suspicion, such actions could have detrimental effects on regular business operations. In, uh, in, I have had residents meet with me, to be fair, in other contexts, where their operational license, licenses were suspended with relatively limited buffer for them to rectify violations, or even while good faith negotiations over addressing highlighted problems appeared to be ongoing. Will the Ministry confirm that, as a matter of course, the FTZ operators will be offered a brief but essential window of opportunity for compliance to written notices under Section 14P Part 3? For instance, the DG can specify the time for a notice under Section 14P Part 6 to take effect 
say, 14 days after the date of service of notice on the licensee, which would be consistent with Section 14P, Part 3, Part C. Of course, this will only apply to Section 14P, Part A through C, which is since national security interests should uh, supersede business disruptions. Nevertheless, this modification, I believe, would provide some grace period for otherwise legitimate business operations. More generally, apart from the DG having le the legal power to take measures or engage in necessary actions to ensure compliance by operators, it remains unclear how such compliance may be ascertained. Similarly, at the licensee level, the systems and procedures that licensees are required to implement to monitor the security of and the movement of goods within the FTC, FTZ excuse me, are also not spelled out. So, while I understand that legislation cannot be expected to detail all possible monitoring and enforcement procedures to ensure compliance with regulation as well as the law, it is worth noting that one major impetus for the proposed revisions is precisely to address the possibility of money laundering and terrorist financing. But it remains to be asked, how will the bill truly advance this goal? This is my second point. After all, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and as we have seen in recent times in the context of real estate, for instance, a surfeit of laws will remain ineffectual so long as compliance is insufficiently observed. Even in the context of free zones, multi -re multiple reports have swirled around alleged illicit activities within Le Freeport, which raises questions on how rigorous the process of due diligence and compliance with regulation truly is. Some of these activities have included tax evasion, storage of looted goods, besides money laundering and terrorist financing. One is left to wonder then how the ministry believes that this devolution to licensed FTZ operators and cargo handlers will improve the pra in practice uh, due diligence as well as regulatory compliance. For instance, in the past, how many contraventions of the Act have been raised to customs over the past five years? And have these instances been flagged by the operators themselves? Or was it because of tip-offs that were received by the authorities? How many FTZ operators and agents operate within our FTZs? And if this is a large number, will this dilute the quality of monitoring and reporting since small operators in partic particular can hardly be expected to sustain the sort of compliance regime that larger ones are able to muster? Relatedly, how many FTZ operators and handlers currently operate in our FTZs and how many are expected to be licensed by the government under the new legislation. So my third point considers the role of free trade zones in the 21st century economy. In principle, traditional free trade zones offer a host of benefits. By exempting tariffs, they facilitate the unfettered flow of goods and services, which are especially critical for transshipment activities. They also attract cross-border finance, since Many typically offer an initial tax holiday, which can embed technological know-how and encourage the development of an otherwise infant industry. And their concentration of industries in one region often promotes the exchange of information and ideas, which can promote economies of both scale and scope. Historically, our economic model has relied on entrepôt trade and foreign direct investment. And so we have benefited as a country significantly from the presence of FTZs. Now, this is all well and good, but it is important for us to understand how the economic landscape is also shifting be beneath us. International trade in goods never quite recovered after the collapse in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, at least as a share of global GDP, prompting some to declare that globalization has reached its peak and others to even pronounce that we are now in a new phase of de-globalization. While I do not, to be clear, share this unvarnished pessimistic view, it is undeniably true that, the, that world merchandise trade has essentially gone sideways since the mid-2000s, and, and may have even declined as a share of output in some cases. 
staking our future on the trend of continued international integration strikes me as risky at best and foolhardy at worst. Similarly, agreements on an international minimum corporate tax, BEPS, while progressing at a slower pace, nevertheless remain on track for a rollout over the next few years, which will similarly weaken some of the advantages that Singapore has enjoyed in terms of attracting global capital through crude tax competition. In any case, modern Singapore as a major global wealth center is now seldom staffed of investment financing, making the benefits of tax-free FTZs somewhat less compelling. This essentially leaves the main advantage of FTZs going forward being that of enhancing the benefits of agglomeration. But the exchange of knowledge and information occurs largely digitally these days. And even if we continue to believe in the merits of in-person exchanges, such spillovers are by no means bound by the artificial boundaries that constitute an FTZ. Indeed, we would surely want the entire nation to be a free trade zone for ideas as well as active inquiry. To this end, one may wonder whether the continued focus on FTZs as key engines of the economy, while unobjectionable on its face, may be missing the bigger picture, which will require our entire nation to be open to flows of data, information, knowledge, and ideas, of course, within the boundaries of the law. Importantly, it is insufficient to cater to such flows only from the perspective of quantitative metrics, ensuring that we have, for instance, a rapid and reliable digital infrastructure, a supportive environment for technology adoption, and adequate exposure for our companies and workers to modern innovations, all of which we do well, but also from a more subtle but just as important qualitative perspective. This means fostering and welcoming open debate over ideas, even uncomfortable ones. This means encouraging out-of-the-box thinking and training our workforce to be truly adaptable and flexible. I understand that all these fall truly outside the scope of the FTZ bill, but we should not forget the ultimate purpose of legislative efforts of this nature. Mr. Speaker, allow me to conclude. While I believe that the changes proposed in the bill meant to provide for safety and efficiency remain important ones to pursue, it remains unclear how the provisions in the bill will truly succeed in meeting them. Moreover, the changing nature of FTZs in the global economy may yet relegate our work here to a back seat, at least from the perspective of long-term economic performance. Hence, while I support the bill, nagging questions over whether it will truly make substantial headway in fulfilling the objectives it purports to achieve nevertheless remain.